lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise. Thank you and welcome to the NAACP Forum. We are Brockton's choice for civil rights news. We are in an exciting time because it's the election year. Again, many candidates are running for re-election. Many candidates are going to be running for their very first time. But we have the exclusive in the studio tonight. We have Mayor Bill Carpenter conducting the first re-election interview uh, for the Brockton community. Mayor Carpenter, welcome. Well, Bishop, Thank it's you great for to be here coming with you. in today. Well, my first time, I think, here with you, but I exactly. yeah, certainly uh, appeared with Ozzy many times over the yes. years on yes. NAACP Forum, and uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here with you tonight. So listen, we, um, we, the way we normally do this is like sitting in the living room of, of someone's home and having an open conversation. Okay. And so I, I begin with some pretty open questions. Why are you seeking re-election? I think that's a pretty easy one. <laughs> I, 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 I honestly believe that we've got a lot of work to still do. And uh, <clears throat> we came in uh, with some, some mandates and, and, and some vision for the city three and a half years ago. And I, I honestly believe that we've turned the ship in the right direction. I believe we're a city that's making progress. I think for the first time in a long time, there's a lot of positive vibe about Brockton. Uh, but at the same token, I'm the first one to tell you that we've got a lot of work to do. So uh, I, I believe that uh, I, I'd like to stay at the job and keep doing that work, and I'd like to see through a lot of the initiatives that we've begun. And, and that's why I'm asking the voters to give me the opportunity to continue to work for another two years. Voter comes up to you and they say to you, just like a job, uh, a job performance appraisal, sure. give me one example of one of your successes. Uh, the city is a safer place than it was three and a half years ago. The unemployment rate is half of what it was three and a half years ago. Uh, the face of city government has changed tremendously. We've embraced diversity, and we now view diversity as a strength of this city. Um, we're revitalizing the downtown. We're seeing positive investment for the first time in decades. I'm sorry, private investment mm -hmm. for the first time in decades in, in our downtown. And uh, I, I believe that our city has a great future, uh, but we, we're just getting started. Mayor, when you, you know, we're at NAACP, so we are the civil rights agency for uh, Plymouth County. So, but when you say we, and I wrote that down and highlighted, when you say we have changed diversity or improved diversity, can you define we? Because the community is pushing back saying that we is not necessarily inclusive of all the, the leaders of the city, maybe some mm -hmm. of the departments believing that diversity is the right way. Yep. Does, am I, do you understand the question? <clears throat> I, I think we, I guess when I say we, I mean, our administration, Street. okay, uh, and I think that at the end of the day, I'm I'm always the guy that's responsible for our administration. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, we is is our city government as a whole, and I think that, uh, I mean, if we want to talk about some of the gains we've made in the last three and a half years, uh, you know, our administration has uh, appointed the first African American woman as a department head in the history of the city. Uh, we uh, reinstated the diversity commission that had laid dormant for years and appointed a very wide-ranging group of individuals who don't all necessarily support me, uh, but we wanted to prove that that commission would be autonomous and would have its own uh, voice. Uh, I hired the very first minority-majority class of police officers in the history of this city. And I have a, a chief of staff uh, who's the first mayor's chief of staff in the history of this city to be a person of color. So, I mean, those are just examples, but I think that any one of those uh, changes on its own would be significant, but I think when you put them all together and now look at a picture and an image and an approach and a philosophy and a change, and, you know, we ran on change four years ago, and I believe we've brought change, and we continue to bring change. So what do you think the greatest obstacle to diversity in the city of Brockton? What is the greatest obstacle in your mind? When you talk about, uh, just focus on when you say diversity within city government. Or yeah, diversity? What, do you think, what is the greatest obstacle within city government? I mean, you, three and a half years ago, what, 
I guess the example. I guess changing the culture has been the challenge. Uh, you know, the culture that I inherited three and a half years this ago. This is what we want to hear. And yeah. Cha yeah. changing the culture, and that's still changing. Uh, but I think that if you ask uh, anyone that visits City Hall from any of our minority communities, mm -hmm. and it's one of the things that makes diversity different here in Brockton mm -hmm, than mm -hmm. most American cities. You know, in most American cities, you, you, you've got a white community and then maybe a large Latino community or a white community and a large African-American community and then maybe a few other small groups mixed in. Well, that's not the case here in Brockton. Here in Brockton, it's African-American, it's Latino, it's Cape Verdean, it's Haitian. It's, it's, you know, we've got half a dozen different significant communities within this city. So I think in some ways the challenge of diversity uh, is a little bit bigger for us. I've got to get a lot more folks pulling in the same direction. But at the same token, it's what's going to make us great in the 21st century because we are, we are becoming what American cities are going to look like in the 21st century. And we have a chance to be on the leading edge of that. And I've, I've said this in speeches before that Brockton today is a multiracial, multi-ethnic right. city. In 10 years, we will be a city of multiracial, multi-ethnic people mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. we're on the leading edge of that curve and that change. And I think that what, what we're embracing and what we're committed to is, is that being a strength of the city and something that helps the city to be a leading city in the 21st century, that we're a city where all people from all places feel as though this is a place where they want to come buy their first home, raise their children, open a business. And that's the city we're building. But Mayor, when you look at the city of Brockton, though, and, and, and I get your philosophy, it's not reflected in a political structure. You have a school committee that it's completely white. Mm -hmm. uh, you have two people of color that are on the Brockton the city council. How, how, what are your suggestions as a non-person of color with respect to how are we going to gain political power in this city? Because it's not there. A lot of people <clears throat> feel that it's not there. Uh, it's not there yet, um, I, but I, I, I do feel it and see it coming and, and changing. Um, I, I think it's, uh, I guess that the story that I try to remind folks sometimes is, you know, I'm of Irish heritage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and where, where, were, where were the Irish 100 years ago? Uh, as an underclass in places like Boston and uh, underemployed and undertrained and, and uh, low income and all of those challenges that any immigrant uh, group faces. Mm -hmm. And when, when did the plight of the Irish community really begin to substantially change when they started gaining some political power? And when you started seeing some Irish city councilors and eventually Irish mayors, and next thing you know, what do you have? Cops and firefighters that half of them are Irish. Right, right. And, and so I mean, it, it, it follows through. So I think, you know, here in Brockton, that change is taking place. Mm -hmm. And I do anticipate after this next election, I believe that there will be more diversity among elected officials. But, you know, really, I think um, the communities in this city have to make a commitment to get more involved, select high quality candidates that can cross all lines and not just appeal to one base, but appeal to all bases and, and, and advocate uh, for this city. And I think that I think those candidates will emerge. I think, and not to be self-serving, everybody wants to run for mayor. Yes. I mean, <laughs> pretty soon it's going to be easy to point out the folks who haven't taken out papers right. to run for mayor. Right. Uh, right. But, but I guess my point would be, and, what, and this is a big part, Tony, I'm glad you brought up of what we've tried to do, one of our aspects, appointments to city boards and commissions. Yep. Because I think for people to be viable candidates for public office in the city, and particularly Gain city citywide, got to get some experience, experience. in okay. city government. Yep. And, and so I believe that the fact that more than half the folks that we've appointed to city boards and commissions in the last three and a half years are folks from our minority communities, I believe we are placing people into responsible roles within city government where they're gaining experience and knowledge and positioning themselves to run for office themselves in the future. And I think, you know, you got to have a farm system. And, and, right. and we, I think that we're developed by appointing people to city boards and commissions, we are developing You're giving future, them some experience. future candidates right. that, that will be highly qualified candidates that will be able to talk about some of their experience working in city government. So I, I want to jump to, because we're still on this issue of equality, equity, and diversity, talk a little bit about the Lopes case. As the chief executive officer, for the city of Brockton now, 
understanding that this did not occur uh, under your watch. Thank you. Do you, do you owe, do you owe um, as the chief, chief executive now an apology to the Lopes family on behalf of the city of Brockton? Well, let me say this. I, I'm glad you mentioned the fact that the events, um, the events that took place uh, in the Lopes lawsuit took place in 2010 and 2011. Um, under a different DPW commissioner and under a different mayor. And I think that if our track record in the last three and a half years is extremely strong um, in hiring But do you, but do you as, as the CEO, Mayor, do you owe the Lopes family an apology on behalf of the city of Brockton? What I can say at this point, so the, the difficulty in my having to choose my words carefully, Bishop, is that right now uh, the city uh, owes Mr. Lopes about $5 million. And that case is under appeal. And I've been cautioned repeatedly by city attorneys, both inside and outside, that I can't discuss the specifics and the merits of the case publicly because it will hurt the city's chances in appeal. And I am responsible to all the taxpayers in the city. However, I think I've been very consistent on saying that I, I, am, I do not question the findings of the jury. And our appeal is based around the size of the award, not the merits of the case. And uh, I do not dispute uh, the findings of the jury. Uh, I do feel that the uh, settlement was excessive for that type of award. That's what the lawyers tell me. Mm -hmm. And I think I have a responsibility, fiduciary responsibility to the taxpayers to make sure that whatever settlement ultimately comes out of the case is fair to both sides. And I think that's where I'm hoping we get to. Do you have any, but do you I have, don't, I have not, I've made it clear yep. that I, ac I accept the findings of the jury and um, uh, I think well, that, yeah. uh, you know. No, I think the community understands that you have some limitations. What I have yeah. done is I, mean, I have brought in people from the outside. That's what I want to ask you yeah, about. Yeah, so I mean we, we, as part of our response, we did uh, go out and bring in uh, an independent investigator who's working now looking at all the uh, facts and issues that were raised by the Lopes case. I think that, you know, there's some things that come out of the Lopes case that you can't dispute. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things the jury did look at is they just looked at the statistics in the DPW at that point in time mm -hmm. and saw whatever it was, 10% or less than 10% of the employees being of color in a city that even at that time was over 40% people of color. That's correct. And, and, and I, think, I think the jury uh, may not have been focused strictly on the facts of the Lopes case, but I think they were kind of looking at the end result and said, well, you know, somebody's discriminating against someone because you can't argue with what the makeup of the workforce looks like. And, and you're saying today in 2017 that, you know, looking at that statistical data back then, but looking now, there has been some transition in DPW. With respect to the There's hiring been a tremendous of of change, color. right? Okay. So, so uh, since uh, since the day I appointed uh, Larry Raleigh as the DPW yep. commissioner in my first six months, yep. uh, forty-eight percent of the people we've hired in the DPW have been from our minority communities, just about half qualified minorities. Because I also hear, and and people know me in the community because I know, I'm one of those folks that hate to, I hate to hear black, white, and so I always yeah. say my white cousins. We're all related yeah. somehow. And I say minority communities. Right. I don't single out any exactly. particular community. So my white cousins tell me, but you know, Bishop, we have to make sure that they're qualified. Yeah, so because we, in their mindset, people being hired, being promoted, yeah. based upon some sort of uh, affirmative action so, quota, that's, that's not that's, the case. That's, that's easy to answer. That's, that one's yeah. really easy to answer. So we always strive to recruit and hire the most highly qualified applicants we can. What's changed is that we now uh, make a conscious effort to recruit and seek out highly qualified candidates from all communities in the city. So you don't have to be someone's cousin to get an interview right. with the DPW anymore. Now, we won't disqualify you if you're someone's cousin, but we're making sure that all qualified applicants are getting a, a shot the at the job. Widely. Widely, okay. And, and, and I believe um, it, it's been to our benefit. Yeah. And I think, our, you know, here's one thing you've got to remember when you talk about how I've responded to the, the city government that I inherited three yep. and a half years ago. The Lopes case, the person that was the hiring decision maker in the Lopes case was the former DPW commissioner, Mike Thorison. He was the hiring authority. 
not the personnel director, the DPW commission. We've, we've actually spoken right. about that. So yeah. what a, what's one of the major changes I made in my first six months as mayor? I removed the DPW commissioner. I knew that that was a person that I was not going to be able to work with going forward, and it was painful. I got a lot of pushback from a lot of folks, and, and we had to negotiate a settlement. Uh, but I removed that DPW commissioner before his term expired, and I brought in someone new because if that's how we had to change the culture in that department. It had to change at the top and then come down. And with a mayor and a commissioner right. who agreed on how we were going to do things, the world has changed dramatically in the DPW. So, so Mayor, you know, we, 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 the NAACP firm, we're not trying to throw uh, the disparaging at all. And I hear what you're saying to me. But why is that not reflected in the school department? Recently, uh, July 7th. That's easy. I don't run the school department. Well, but, but, sir, you are the chairman of the, the, the Brockton School Committee. Right. Uh, so with respect to the Brockton School Committee, so on July 7th, 2017, Brockton names new high school principal. Uh, this is uh, 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 giving credit to Joanna Sells at the uh, Boston Globe. Mm -hmm. So Clifford Murray, the principal of the Brockton West Middle School was taking over, replacing Sharon Walder at the Brockton High School. We have worked on the issue of diversity here at the NAACP, really looking at transparency. Kind of what you're, you're talking about, increasing this pool. But yet we see, a, we all know Sharon, and she, she's exceptional. Glad that she got this promotion to the central office. Disappointed that her role wasn't open. Why is a position like this, knowing that all this is happening in the city in terms of diversity, why wasn't this position posted for that wide open pool? And I know you... But no, I'm no, I'm, I'm gonna, so let me give you the answer. Yeah, okay. So first, the beginning of the answer is that the superintendent of schools runs the schools. That's what the law says. That's what the Education Reform Act of 93 says. The school committee oversees policy, budget, and hiring and firing the superintendent, which includes evaluating the superintendent mm -hmm. each year. Um, in terms of the opening at the high school, uh, I disagree with the manner in which the superintendent filled the opening. Uh, I think that Dr. Define Murray... Define disagreement, sir. Well, I don't think it was done properly. I mean, let me tell you how I think it should have been done. So, okay. Dr. Murray is a highly qualified candidate for the position. He was a finalist when Sharon Walder was yep, hired. I remember. He's earned his PhD since then, and he gets excellent reviews for his work at West Junior High. Um, my guess is he's probably the strongest in-house candidate. Having said that, the principal at the high school is the second highest profile position in the entire school system. Correct. A school system of 17,500 yeah. students, almost 2,000 employees. Um, I don't understand why we wouldn't have a recruit, a search, recruit, and selection process for that position. And it should have been done. It should have been open. It should have been transparent. Um, I think Dr. Murray will do a fine job. Well, however, wait, however, right. but let me finish. Yep. However, I think that we should have found out what other highly qualified candidates may have been interested in the position besides Dr. Murray. I think there may have been a missed opportunity to steal someone else's rising superstar that might have jumped from another system to Brockton for the opportunity to be the principal at Brockton High School. Uh, I don't like the message it sends to people that are here. And, and not that we have that many high-ranking administrators of color, um, but, you know, we've got a principal of the Edison Academy at Brockton High School, Dr. Jim Cobbs, mm, sure. African-American, Brockton resident, Ph.D., lives in the city. I have a hard time explaining to Dr. Cobbs why he didn't get an interview for the position. Um, I'm not saying he would have, should have received the position, but I think he deserved an interview if he sought one, and I don't know whether he sought one or not, but I think he would deserve one. And I think that such a high-profile position may have drawn some interest from some highly qualified people outside the system. Correct. So there should have been a process where we recruited to see who else was interested, evaluated, picked three, three or four of the highly, most highly qualified candidates. I would have no problem with Dr. Murray being a finalist in that group, and I have no problem if ultimately the superintendent selects Dr. Murray. The problem is with the process, or in this case, the lack of a process. And um, so I would, uh, and, and I, I discussed this with the superintendent, and so I'm not saying anything here publicly that I haven't said to her privately. I told her that I would not be able to support her in this decision, and, and I don't. And uh, I agree with your position that this should have been an open, transparent process where we sought the most highly qualified candidates 
and then selected the best one for the future of the children of the city. And that may have turned out to have been Dr. Murray, but we should have gone through the process. So, so the NAAC, so you know, our position is, is and I think that this is where people, and, and this is why we have to have dialogue. We're not looking for quotas, but we are looking, just what you're saying, to increase that employment pool, right. to increase the applicant pool, excuse well, me. I, I so think the good word here is yeah. opportunity. Correct. No one else was given the opportunity to that's interview the, for the position, right. and that's where I think they went wrong. And uh, I, you know, the superintendent and I uh, worked together pretty well most of the time, but I disagreed with that decision, and I think that um, I've been pretty clear about it. Let's jump to crime, Mayor. Tell me, what is your um, public safety plan for the city of Brockton in light of these most recent murders? Well, first of all, I think there's only been one murder recently. Um, there's been a couple of shootings recently. Uh, gun violence is an issue and a challenge in every American city. I go to mayor's conferences. There's not one mayor anywhere in the United States that is not dealing with the challenges of reducing violent crime in general, reducing gun violence. Uh, we've made some real progress in this city over the last three and a half years. Um, uh, homicide is not a real good statistic to keep track of. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's there's a little bit of luck involved in that statistic, but I do think incidents of gun-related crime and incidents of gun violence are good statistics. And you know, we're having an independent uh, report finalized now on our crime statistics for the last couple of years, and it's going to show that gun violence is down about 30 percent in the city since three years ago. Now, just because we're making progress and just because the city is safer than it used to be does not mean that we don't still face this same challenge every day of making the city safer, reducing gun violence. So, you know, we've taken a number of approaches, both short-term, mid-term, and long-term. So, I mean, from a law enforcement standpoint, uh, I think that we've adopted a strategy. We know that a, the vast majority of gun violence is committed by a very small percentage of the folks in the city. Right. And so, uh, we've really focused our intelligence efforts on identifying repeat violent offenders, focusing attention on them, and working with uh, state and federal law enforcement agencies and identifying targets of mutual interest. When you say repeat violent offenders, clear something up for me because a lot of people have asked me this question too. So we have this philosophy, you know we love our city. Outsiders are coming in creating violence in the city. Are they outsider or are they residents, Mayor, if you look at the statistics? So when you say these repeat violent offenders, are they our residents? Are they folks that are coming from other communities, creating havoc and then disappearing? Well, I Because I remember you talked about the rental right. car thing. Well, and, and so it's, I guess it's both. And I think yeah. that um, just like uh, drug dealing, gun violence doesn't start or stop at the city border. Correct. And I think that it's w what you're citing is one of the reasons why we've put so much emphasis on working with regional, state, and federal agencies because we know that, uh, as an example, I'm going to be attending in the near future a, a gun trafficking summit that Marty Walsh is hosting. Okay. We know that gun trafficking is a regional issue. It's not an individual community issue. It's a regional issue. And so we need state and federal cooperation on slowing down the flow of Ill illegal guns coming into our city. We know that there's a pipeline of guns that comes from New Hampshire and Maine. Mm. Um, we, we know that there are guns that come from southern states with loose gun laws. And so when people are trafficking in guns, they're bringing them over state lines. That's a regional uh, approach that we need in state and federal help. And so in all of our, so another part of our gun strategy has been to uh, invest in more um, investigations into larger scale drug dealers because we know that um, uh, folks with gang affiliations tend to be in the drug distribution business. People in the drug distribution business tend to carry guns. Mm -hmm. You really can't separate the two anymore. But we know that when we're, we're pursuing drug dealers and trying to um, r lower the availability of deadly drugs in, our, in the streets of our city, that we get guns at the same time. But something, so you haven't mentioned neighborhood policing or community policing. Do you well, believe you asked me, no, well, so let me, yeah. let me yeah. finish the answer then. Yeah. So that's in terms of immediate impact, on sh violence. shorter term, yeah. on gun violence right. specifically. Yeah. There's no question our longer term strategies focus around community policing, 
and they really focus around working with young people at young ages. Good. Prevention is the long-term answers. We're never going to be able to arrest all the folks that, that uh, are carrying illegal guns, nor is that going to ever be the answer. So I think we're, in, we're investing more and more in working with young people. I think that, and I think it's a very similar approach whether we're trying to steer children away from uh, gun activity and gang activity mm -hmm. or, or drugs. I think that we need to raise children in this city with a sense of hope and opportunity. I think we need to raise children in the city with positive role models. Um, I, think we, I think children have to have self-esteem and they have to believe that they have a real value and opportunity growing up in this city. Um, and I think we have to help them develop their decision-making skills at a young age so that they can resist peer pressure and make better decisions because kids are making decisions in the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade right. that determine what direction their life goes. So that's where the real long-term answers take place. And I believe the middle school grades are the battleground, which means we've got to be working with children even younger than that. So, so Mayor, you said you, you, you're again using this word we, and the reason why I'm going to focus on that for the, the next two minutes is because one of your opponents recently said in the Brockton Enterprise that you have blood on your hands. Yeah. Blood I, on your hands. Yeah, I, I, I'm not even going to justify that comment with a response. So you tell the community when you say we, I've been pushing parental involvement. I've been pushing that the government can't do it all. I've been pushing is either parents or the police. We have to make these choices. Who is the we that needs to help us with this, this, this yep. epidemic so, of youth violence? So, uh, you know, to me, community policing begins with um, building a, a more diverse police force that more accurately represents the people of the community that it serves. We're doing that. And in our next police class that, that we're in the process of appointing now, you'll see even more of that. I think we have to build bridges of trust and communication between communities in the city who don't trust the police and police that have not always been the best communicators in the world. And I think we're working on all of those things. We've expanded our commitment to community policing. Um, we are, uh, you know, you asked me about gun violence. Uh, in the last two years, there have been more homicides by domestic violence than I by gun that. violence. I realize that. And, and so yep. uh, that means we've also made a substantial commitment in trying to assign police officers working proactively with social service agencies and identifying and protecting victims of domestic violence and doing education, intervention, and prevention with domestic violence also. So um, community policing begins with building a more diverse police force, building trust and communication, and changing attitudes on both sides. I think one of the biggest changes that we've seen in three and a half years is with the Champion Plan, and we're now Folks that are struggling with drug addiction can walk into a police station, ask for help, and not get arrested, get immediate help, and have someone bring them to a safe haven and get them into a treatment bed. It's changed the perceptions of police, of people who are struggling with addiction. Absolutely. It's also changed the perceptions of people that have been arrested before. Most people struggling with addiction right. have had some negative interaction with the police department before. They're changing their perceptions too, because you couldn't have got that person to walk into a police station. You're three absolutely years right. Ago. So, Mayor, we only have a minute left. I need you to. And we've been on some of the negatives of the city. That's okay. Tell, I told tell, you. I told you. No holds barred, Bishop. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Just so, remember, you're a man of God. <laughs> that's, right, that's right. That's right. So, so in our closing minute, tell us what is right about the city, and tell us when's that primary election coming up. <laughs> well, what's right about the city is that we're building a city of opportunity. And, and, and I guess from the NAACP's perspective, even more importantly, we're building a city of equal opportunity. Absolutely. And, and we're building a city with an environment where we can raise children and offer them every opportunity and every child gets the same opportunity. We're building a city where people want to come open a business, come purchase a home, come raise their children. And uh, that perception doesn't change overnight. But I say with all my heart, I do believe this city is a better place to live in than it was three and a half years ago. You all heard it directly from here. The mayor says this place is a better place to live. Right. And my parents a a acknowledging, <laughs> that, <laughs> acknowledging that we, we have still have a lot of work to do. But I do believe the city is a better place to live than it was three and a half years yep. ago. And I'm asking uh, the voters for the opportunity to continue to work towards those goals for the next two years. Ladies and gentlemen, Mayor Bill Carpenter joined us here at the NAACP Forum. He, was, he did very well, some pretty tough questions. Listen, we need you to tune in again, and we'll be speaking to you very soon. Mayor, thank you for coming in. My When's pleasure, the primary Bishop. election again? September 19th, September I 19th. Don't forget the votes, All people. Right. God bless you, and good night.
Thank you, Tony.